I call this meeting of the Committee on Health and Human Service Policy to order. There is a quorum present. May I have a motion to approve the minutes for Wednesday, February the 27th? Madam Chair, I'll move the minutes. Representative Pearson moves approval of the minutes for Wednesday, February the 27th. Any discussion? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes for Wednesday, February the 27th are approved. I'd like to take this moment to welcome Representative Keel back to the committee. It's good to see you. Thank you. And the first bill of the day would be House File 717, Representative Mariani. Thank you, Madam Chair. Good afternoon uh, to you and to the members. Good afternoon. So the chair moves that House File 717 be recommended for re-referral to the Committee on Government Operations. Um, Representative Mariani, I understand you have an author's amendment. Madam Chair, I do. We will entertain a motion of the A19 author's amendment. So moved. Okay, Representative Mann, so moved. Representative Mann moves. Uh, the A-19 Authors Amendment. All in favor say aye. All aye. opposed? Aye. The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. Representative Mariani. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. And I'm sorry, I'm still getting myself together. I just finished uh, chairing my own committee uh, a few minutes ago. But uh, basically, um, I'm really proud to bring this bill uh, before you uh, for consideration or for our legislature to uh, deliberate carefully uh, about the uh, movement toward uh, full uh, legalization uh, of marijuana, uh, otherwise known as, you know, adding recreational purposes because we obviously have uh, some levels of legalization in this state, particularly re uh, rel relative to medical use. Uh, the intent of this bill, quite frankly, Madam Chair and members, is to bring Minnesotans together to have an honest and legitimate conversation on the impacts uh, of marijuana and state the efforts on uh, uh, individuals and our state um, and to have a deep dive, a fact-finding dive in terms of, of how we might regulate it and, and decriminalize it um, given uh, the strong interests across the state uh, for legalizing marijuana. And so, in other words, as opposed to doing an immediate dive in that direction, the purpose of this bill is to bring together uh, key stakeholders uh, to have a deliberate, um, careful, uh, honest, uh, open conversations um, about um, our statutory framework our practices in the state uh, if we move toward a, a full legalization of marijuana. Members uh, are aware, uh, no doubt, that 10 states plus the District of Columbia um, have made recreational cannabis legal for adult use. Uh, 14 states have made medical cannabinoid legal. 22 states have made medical cannabinoid and THC uh, legal, including our state. Our neighbor, Canada, long made medical um, uh, access uh, legal and has just made recreational access uh, for adults uh, uh, legal within the last year. So uh, this bill will set up a task force of diverse interests, including health experts, regulatory state departments, law enforcement, uh, local practitioners, community activists, and others to review issues related to possible further legalization as it potentially impacts public safety, as it impacts public health, as it impacts tax policy uh, and regulatory oversight. Uh, some of the areas that this bill would expect uh, this task force to uh, dive into are things like uh, security, uh, treatment for chemical dependency, uh, education efforts, particularly education efforts uh, for minors, um, how uh, expungement issues, uh, how to regulate the cultivation, the processing, the transporting, the sales, 
in short, you know, the business uh, sector aspects uh, of, of marijuana, uh, participation of minority-owned businesses, uh, and uh, reviewing technical changes in statute related to all of those that may need uh, to be changed. The task force will use the review to then advise the legislature, us, on what we should be addressing if there's a movement toward uh, legalizing marijuana beyond its current medical uh, access use. Uh, the idea, quite frankly, behind 717 is to not rush towards full legalization uh, without a careful review of, of these potential issues. Uh, to engage transparently a broad range of stakeholders, including the public, in a discussion about responsible approaches uh, through a, a little bit longer time than we have uh, during our legislative uh, process here. Uh, learn the pros and the cons that, um, that are experienced in other states who have moved uh, toward fuller uh, uh, legalization. And then, of course, again, to provide all of that uh, for the legislature's uh, consideration um, in a uh, future determination on the legalization of marijuana. Uh, and so, Madam Chair, the, the bill is really uh, 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 simple structure in terms of laying out its purpose, uh, identifying the members uh, of the task force, um, how to get organized, uh, um, asking the Commissioner of Health uh, to provide support staff, uh, space, and administrative services for the task force, and then spelling out uh, the duties uh, that I uh, quickly are, uh, went through, and then mandating a report back uh, to the legislature. Um, in the amendment, we have January 1st of 2020 for that report back, which would give the um, 2020 uh, legislative session uh, time to then act if uh, if it's if we so feel like acting uh, at that time, uh, Madam Chair, members, uh, this has been a a constantly evolving um, uh, bill uh, as we've engaged pretty broadly uh, with a number of key stakeholders. Uh, uh, for advice, uh, ranging from uh, law enforcement uh, folks to uh, proponents for the legalization of marijuana, health individuals, um, you know, just a broad group of folks. Um, and with that have come uh, a number of recommendations that we've embedded into uh, the amendment that was adopted uh, to continue to ensure that uh, there is a um, a equal and inclusive uh, representation uh, of the task force members um, uh, on it. And um, I, it is certainly my intent uh, to continue to have that open door uh, approach in terms of building a good deliberative body uh, of Minnesotans that can provide us the best information relative toward um, a movement uh, towards legalization of marijuana. And so with that, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll stop. But there are a number of folks that uh, are going to come forward and issue uh, their recommendation, or rather their support, express their support, um, and further recommendations for uh, this committee to consider. Thank you, Representative Mariani. Um, so let's start with the testifiers. The first one, Nancy Haas. You don't quite look like Nancy, but... You don't look like Nancy. <laughs> so, please, give Quite her. frankly, I wish I did look like Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> Madam Chair, uh, members of the committee, uh, Chair uh, Mariani, thank you very much. My name is Robert Small. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota County Attorneys Association. Our association, uh, while it has not yet taken an official position on this bill, we do have a subcommittee of our board members who are looking at various marijuana issues. And I did have the opportunity to have a number of conversations with members of that subcommittee. And they were all in agreement with the idea of a task force as proposed in House File 7, 
17 that would carefully look at the multitude of issues surrounding the legalization of cannabis, and we look forward to being a part of that conversation. And I want to thank Representative Mariani for uh, calling the county attorneys to the table early on. I anticipate our association will formally move to support this bill at our next meeting, uh, which would be next week. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Small. Dennis Flattery. <laughs> Pat, Madam, Madam Chair, uh, members, my name is Dennis Flaherty, and I'm Executive Director of the Minnesota Police and Peace Officers Association. We're an um, association of rank and file officers. We have about 9,000 members spread out across the state. Um, I am here in support of um, this legislation, and um, I've had the opportunity to actually have some input into some changes that we felt appropriate that Representative Mariani was kind enough to incorporate. Um, we see this um, task force as um, actually doing due diligence and doing it on uh, behalf of the citizens of the state of Minnesota, um, which we think is very important uh, before making a decision the magnitude of the size of the commercialization of of marijuana. Um, the makeup of this task force um, is diverse. Uh, however, we would like to see more representation from the medical and um, treatment professions and less from the cannabis industry. And by the way, Representative Mariani told me, feel free to um, incorporate some other ideas that sure. I may have thought of uh, since I've talked with him yesterday. Um, and it also does uh, have a, a, um, an appropriation, which I'm very happy to see because I think it's real important that we're able to bring in um, government officials from other states that have legalized it. And the bill does say that, but I hoping that it would spell out or specify that these quote government officials quote would be the regulators and enforcement people from these 10 other jurisdictions that have legalized it to talk about um, uh, perhaps the things they may have wished that they had uh, put in the bill. Um, we see this as a, a group of fact finders on your behalf and that uh, would provide you hopefully the pros and the cons of legalization and we realize that ultimately it's your decision to make. Um, it's not a secret that law enforcement um, does presently uh, oppose the legalization, uh, but we think it, and it's a huge decision to make and we just want it to be made after you have all of the facts before you. Um, at this point, we really have not done that. All the states that have taken that step should be heard from and you should know what they know. Um, I was thinking this morning there's that old saying that I think is appropriate here is that you don't know what you don't know. And I think it's it really applies here. And so I see this bill as an opportunity to learn exactly uh, um, to learn to know. Uh, about all of the downs and dirties and the pluses of of the legalization. So I, I do stand in support of this legislation. Thank you so much for your uh, support and your willingness to be open to learn to know. Appreciate it. Uh, Lili Fati, please uh, restate your name for the records. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Laylee Fadahi, and I'm a lawyer and have spent over a decade developing and advocating for robust governance and oversight approaches to complex policy issues that have significant health, economic, and social implications, including formerly as an academic researcher at the University of Minnesota Law School, Humphrey School of Public Affairs, and Center for Bioethics, where I spent the first half of my career. 
I'm also the campaign manager for Minnesotans for Responsible Marijuana Regulation, or MRMR. We're a statewide multipartisan coalition and campaign that supports the legalization and responsible regulation of marijuana for safe adult recreational use in Minnesota. Murmur steering committee and coalition members include former state legislators from both the Republican and DFL parties, Minnesota business owners, justice reform advocates, indigenous community leaders, civil society organizations like the NAACP, ACLU, community action, Jewish Community Action, and others, the mayor of Minneapolis, and a growing list of mayors and city council members from across the state. And we all urge you to support House File uh, 717. As we've been reaching out to diverse communities and organizations and affinity groups and policymakers from all corners of Minnesota, what has been evident above all else is that Minnesotans from all walks of life want to know more and want to be engaged more about what legalization could mean and what legalization could look like in Minnesota, rather than being subjected to the far less nuanced question of just whether or not we should legalize. For many Minnesotans, it's a matter of feeling that they don't have enough information or facts. They've seen other states legalize marijuana and generate enormous tax revenues that they've invested into their schools and public programs and infrastructure, but they want to know more about the impacts of legalization on public safety or health. And then still other Minnesotans feel that given the rapidly changing public opinion in support of legalization, that legalization is inevitable in Minnesota. And that if it's going to happen, we should make sure that it happens in a way that benefits rather than excludes Minnesota farmers, that keeps our children safe from being advertised or sold cannabis products when they're underage, and which maintains the safety of our roads, and certainly that redresses the disproportionate impacts that marijuana prohibition has had on people and in communities of color. And that's why today you're going to hear testimony and see letters of support from organizations that you've ne maybe never thought you would see a letter of support from in favor of something addressing legalization. Um, Minnesotans and Minnesota, I mean, Minnesota is ready to talk meaningfully about legalization, and we hope that you are ready to give them the forum and the opportunity to do so. Thank you. Thank you so much. Zach Robbins. And Ben Fess will be next. Thank you. Please introduce yourself for the record. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Zach Robbins. I'm an attorney and a board director at Minnesotans for Responsible Marijuana Regulation, a newly created 501c4. I am here to support uh, HF 717 to create a task force to advise the legislature on legalization, taxation, and regulation of cannabis production sale and use by those 21 uh, and over. As a business attorney who participates in regulated industries, I'm contacted weekly by interested parties of varying expertise, backgrounds, race, income, from geographic locations across the state, and from very diverse political beliefs who all ask the same questions. When will this be legal and how can I participate? The answer to the first question is hopefully soon assuming that this task force is approved. The answer to the second question, how can I participate, is more interesting, and that's why I'm here today to talk. That's because this new industry will touch so many fields, namely farmers, both uh, in the field operators and greenhouse cultivators, processors and extractors, contract manufacturers, retail brands, distributors, and retailers, or otherwise known as dispensaries not to mention those who benefit secondarily, such as real estate owners, equipment manufacturers, packaging companies, warehousing companies, transportation companies, and service providers such as attorneys, accountants, and consultants. This industry would produce substantial revenues upon launch. These revenues, both direct and indirect, will help ensure that our state residents have high quality paying jobs and keep us competitive with other states that offer a regulated system. 
For these reasons and others, I urge the committee today to support this bill and ensure that Minnesota has a well planned out system to contemplate the safe sale of THC products to those 21 and older. Thank you. Thank you so much for your testimony. Ben Feist. Please introduce, introduce yourself for the record. Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Ben Feist. I am the Legislative Director for the ACLU of Minnesota. I'm also a steering committee member with uh, Minnesotans for Responsible Marijuana Regulation. The ACLU's primary interest in the area of marijuana regulation is driven by the issue of racial disparities. Our history of criminalization of marijuana has had a staggeringly disproportionate impact on African Americans and other communities of color and comes at a tremendous human and financial cost. Arrests and convictions for possessing marijuana can negatively impact public housing, student financial aid eligibility, employment opportunities, child custody determinations, and immigration status. A 2013 report from the National ACLU found that blacks are almost eight times more likely than whites to be arrested for marijuana possession in Minnesota, even though data shows that use rates are actually very similar. This was the third largest racial disparity in the United States uh, when all the states were looked at for that report. We ultimately do support the legalization of marijuana through a system of taxation, licensing, and regulation. However, getting to the right regulation for Minnesota will take a lot of work and, impact and input from many stakeholders. We acknowledge that this will be a lengthy process and in order to do this the right way, we want to make sure that everyone is at the table. This bill goes a long way to making that framework happen and is certainly an important first step in moving our state forward in a responsible manner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Feist. Um, Maren Schroeder and after that, Randy um, Anderson. Please introduce yourself on the record. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, my name is Marin Schroeder and I'm president of Sensible Minnesota. We are a 501c3 with a mission to make our neighborhoods safer and more inclusive for those negatively impacted by cannabis prohibition and the war on drugs. We promote societal changes that emphasize compassion, restorative justice, and public health. One of the main things we do is we run a medical cannabis patient program. You'll hear more from me about that later. Um, and we have worked with persons harmed by prohibition to share their stories. We've extensively researched implementation of legalization in other states. And we've built a network of advocates, industry professionals, patients, and consumers throughout the country to solicit for advice and data. While we understand that full legalization is a complicated subject, um, we appreciate Representative Mariani's proposal to create a task force of stakeholders to ensure Minnesota is thoughtful in developing public pr policies surrounding cannabis legalization. Um, I thank Representative Mariani for amendments adding a medical cannabis patient, um, as well as two representatives from non-industry nonprofits. Um, it's really important to us to have the people who will be affected by the outcome at the table. Uh, we would also recommend the addition of a person previously incarcerated for a marijuana offense. The issue of legalization is hugely important to us, as we are not only advocates, Many of our volunteers are patients or parents or caregivers for medical cannabis patients. The impact of full legalization will surely reach the medical cannabis market. Um, I look forward to seeing the task force come to fruition to ask the questions to provoke the best policies for Minnesota, and I urge you to support the bill today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Schroeder. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to say a few words. <clears throat> and thank you, Representative Mariano, for bringing this bill forward. My name is Randy Anderson, and I'm a person living in long-term recovery. And what that means to me is I haven't had to use drugs, alcohol, or any mood-altering substance since January 9, 2005. I'm also a state-licensed alcohol and drug counselor and a formerly incarcerated individual due to drug-related offenses. We hear this false dichotomy that there's only two stances on this issue, incarceration or legalization, which I believe actually is commercialization. I strongly believe that there's a better way forward than incarceration. There's a better way forward than commercialization, and we need to be do devoting our resources, our time, our energy to finding a path between those two extremes. 
It's well known that when a substance becomes legal, perceived harm, especially with adolescents, is significantly reduced. And when perceived harm goes down, use increases. According to one of our nation's leading scientists, Dr. Nora Volko, director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, the greatest mortality from drugs comes from legal drugs. The moment you make a drug legal, you're going to increase the number of people who get exposed to it, and therefore you increase the negative consequences from its use. When you legalize, you create an industry whose purpose is to make money selling those drugs. And how do you sell it? Mostly by enticing people to take them and entice them to take high quantities. In the 70s, 80s, and even into the 90s, THC levels, THC, the main psychoactive compound in marijuana that gives the high sensation to average between 2 and 4%. By 2014, THC levels are hovered around 14%. Thanks to sophisticated farming, cloning techniques, and the demand of users to get a stronger high more quickly, selective breeding has resulted in average marijuana potency of 20% THC. Some strains exceed 30%. Marijuana concentrates and extracts, much more commonly used in the last five years, have THC levels that range from 40 to more than 80 percent. That is according to the Marijuana Industry Promotional Information and Drug Enforcement Administration reports. Researchers do not yet know the full extent of consequences when the body and the brain, especially developing brain, are exposed to high concentrations of THC. According to the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse in Columbia University, 90% of those people with addiction began using alcohol or other drugs before turning 18. I would also add, I think a member of uh, the committee could be uh, someone in addiction recovery from marijuana use. Uh, regardless of what my state, our state, decides the next step should be, I recommend we move slow and cautiously forward and allow all voices to be heard for and against the commercialization of marijuana. In closing, I would pose the question, what is it we are attempting to accomplish? It's more than obvious the war on drugs failed, so continuing those types of policies benefits no one. However, from an addiction, treatment, recovery perspective, do we really want to introduce another intoxicating substance and make it more widely available in our communities? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Jeremy Sankey. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Madam Chair, my name is Jeremy Sankey. I'm the founder of Minnesota Veterans for Cannabis. Um, my organization is in uh, full support of the Cannabis Task Force. We do, however, have some things we would like to see. Um, 1.2 of this bill, it says relating to health. However, when I read through the membership of the task force, there's less than 25 percent of uh, health uh, membership um, positions. In addition to that, um, in uh, subdivision five, um, the duties of the task force, um, I don't see a lot about health in there. Um, I know this is about legalization for adult personal use, uh, but like it was said before, um, there is no way adult personal use is not going to have effect on people that use cannabis for medicinal reasons. That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. So that is our last schedule uh, testifier. Is there anyone in the audience who wishes to testify on House File 717? Please come down to the testifying table. All right, welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Marcus Harkis. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Campaign for Full Legalization. Excuse me. We're organizing a statewide grassroots campaign to help end prohibition to establish an adult personal use cannabis industry, to establish home growing rights, and to help repair the victims of these unjust prohibition laws. I'm also a consumer. And I smoked some nice, high-grade, high-potency cannabis this morning, and I'm still alive. I just have a series of questions I'd like to ask the committee, and I am in favor of this task force. 
we represent over half a million adult Minnesotan consumers in the state of Minnesota. So this is a matter of life and death for a lot of people. Here's the first question. Do you know that marijuana prohibition is based on political corruption, pseudoscience, racism, and for-profit policing? Did you know that cannabis is a healing plant with scores of therapeutic health benefits and not a dangerous killer drug? And unlike opiates, alcohol, and other drugs, legal and illegal, cannabis has no lethal dose? That cannabis is not highly addictive, as drug addiction science has proven less than 10% of consumers get addicted? Did you know that cannabis is ironically a life-saving exit drug for countless people, not a so-called gateway drug, because most cannabis consumers do not go on to try harder drugs, and most consumers don't even continue the habit? Did you know that prohibition has failed to eliminate the illicit cannabis market, which now serves more than a half a million adult consumers in Minnesota? Did you know that there are more than Half a million of us that are living in fear of being criminalized and potentially losing everything over this healing plant, and it just makes us feel better. It's never killed a human being in the thousands of years of known human use. Did you know, do, uh, do you agree that we should not be wasting tens of millions of dollars annually in law enforcement resources to arrest and harass thousands of Minnesotans over cannabis? Do you know that the most dangerous thing about cannabis is getting caught with it by the police because you could lose your freedom lose your job, lose your property, have your property seized even without being convicted. You can lose your housing and your children. Do you understand or do you agree that full legalization is about human rights, not about cannabis consumers having fun getting high? Although that shouldn't be illegal if they're not, we're not harming anyone. Cannabis is a healing plant, it's not a crime. I'm almost done. Do you know that thousands of lives are ruined annually because of prohibition and the longer that we push this down the road, we're going to have nearly 10,000 people arrested every year? Do you agree that if one truly loves justice, you must hate cannabis prohibition because it's senseless, it's expensive, it's corrupt, it's structurally racist, and it's failed? Last question. Do you understand that there's not one good reason to justify a prohibition? But the imperatives of full legalization include respecting personal freedom, increasing public safety, improving public health, and creating economic development statewide. So I'm glad that the initial draft of this bill was amended to include people that are most affected. I am in favor of forming this, this task force if the people who are most affected are at the table. So I appreciate the amendment was, that was made, and I support this bill. I just want to close by saying that I'd, I'd like to quote uh, Carl Sagan. The illegal, illegality of cannabis is an outrageous, it's an impediment to the full utilization of a drug which helps produce the serenity and insight, the sensitivity and fellowship so desperately needed in this increasingly mad and dangerous world. So I just want to let you all know that prohibition is the problem, it's not cannabis, and that full legalization is the only solution. and that. If you include us at the table, we have some expertise because we've been studying this. So thank you for your attention and please vote to pass this bill. And thank you for introducing it. Thank you so much for your testimony. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to testify? Okay. Any discussion from committee members? Chair Liebling. Well, thank you, Madam Chair. And Representative Mariani, thank you for undertaking this effort. You know, I, um, as everybody probably knows, I introduced a bill to legalize cannabis in the last uh, term and I uh, have one again this year. And one thing that I've learned in the research that I did um, leading up to that, and I, I did do quite a bit of research, is how very complicated this is as a policy matter. And um, I... I think that you've um, you've got a good direction here, and we've we've gone some back and forth about some of the way the bill is drafted. And um, Madam Chair, is this going? Uh, where does this bill go now? To the this floor? Bill goes to government ops. To gov ops. Okay. So, and um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, so the bill isn't done making its path through the committee structure. And I'm you know I'm sure that you'll get input from more members in terms of how to how they people want the committee to be, the task force to be set up. But I do think that this is a, a good direction because um, 
we are so different than other states in that we don't have a referendum process. So other, other states have legalized cannabis for personal use through some kind of referendum where the people have spoken and then the legislature has had to catch up um, putting in laws, uh, you know, making clear what the boundaries are for various things and trying to catch up with the policies. In Minnesota, for, for good or bad, we don't have that process. And so we, um, whatever we do, whatever we do, um, if, if cannabis is going to be legalized in Minnesota, and I, I do believe it should be for the reasons that, many of the reasons that were spoken here, um, we're gonna need to really grapple as a legislature with the nitty gritty of what the policy should look at before we enact a policy. And even if we were to just put it on the ballot, even a bill to do that, just for people in the room, a bill to have a constitutional amendment also has to go through the legislature. So there is no way around. We are going to grapple with these issues. Um, at the end of the day, the legislature is going to decide one way or the other. No matter what this task force will come up with, ultimately the decision will be made in the legislature and, of course, by the governor. Um, assuming that we would pass something. Of course, a constitutional amendment does not have to be signed by the governor to go on the ballot. But I'm assuming that we will pass something through this legislature if we're going to legalize, and the governor will sign it. And so that means we have an enormous amount of work to do. And many of us have wrestled with a lot of the underlying issues, and we've had a real taste of that today with some of the testifiers. So I, I think this is a good direction. I hope this will take us um, to a really good policy where we will be able to learn from the mistakes of other states and jurisdictions that have done this and at the same time forge our own path and kind of show the world what it looks like when we think about it beforehand and really grapple with the issues and bring in the public and listen to all the voices and try to get a policy that will best serve the people of this state. And this is a very controversial issue, and we've had a taste of that here today as well. Um, I'm sure that controversy will, will continue to exist. Um, legislatures are made for controversy. That's, that's what we're about. Different members are going to have different opinions. But I think having uh, a good, uh, you know, having a task force grapple with these issues and come in with at least some information and at least telling us as much as they can, what are the things that we have to consider as we move forward? I think that that will, will be very helpful if it's done in the right way. So I do appreciate your taking some suggestions from me as you went forward with this, Representative Mariani, and I know there will be, there will be more suggestions, and um, thank you very much for undertaking this task. Yeah. Right. Madam, Madam Chair. Representative. Mariani. Uh, Madam Chair, just very quickly, uh, Representative Liebling, I, I think you gave my closing uh, remarks here, but uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for, for that, and also thank you for uh, the advice that you've offered uh, me and others as well as we shape this. Um, it is my intent to shape this um, as best as, as I can with as much input uh, as possible. I think that um, one of the things that's impressed me, it's been a lot of work, but one of the things that's impressed me a lot is uh, the, incre the incredible diversity of people and interests that have weighed in. And I think we're, the, we're, we're at our best when we create the space for that to happen, even as we move toward a final decision, uh, which is inevitably going to make some of those people unhappy. But the point is that uh, when we get to that point, uh, we will have been engaging with as many Minnesotans uh, as possible. I think one of the advantages of having this group formed um, and operational over the course of the next year is that it will allow us to maximize that value and that dynamic uh, temporarily free from the uh, incredible pressures and time constraints of a legislative session. Uh, as Representative Liebling uh, shared uh, perfectly well, uh, to get to an outcome any different than the status quo, we will need to go through a legislative session. So that time will come. But this at least will give us until then 
an ability to really expand that 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 ownership and that working together. Um, um, and as you you can see for some of the testifiers, we have folks that don't necessarily agree on what the ultimate outcome is, but they want to be able to have that space to do that. And so it, it's um, I, I hope that we can be successful with this and set up that dynamic. But thank you for your comments, Representative Lee. Okay, uh, Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, thank you, Representative Mariani, for bringing this together. Um, we worked we work with one of your previous uh, members on the medical cannabis bill, so that was a, a broad coalition uh, of effort on that. As I look at the membership of the task force, and this is not a criticism, but as a, an assist, an observation, if you will, you know, obviously Mr. Flaherty and, and Mr. Sankey also shared some of the desires uh, for inclusion on that. And, and folks or, or uh, advocates that come to mind uh, immediately, that was Mr. Uh, Flaherty's as well as Mr. Sankey's observation. There doesn't seem to be a preponderance of folks on this or, or entities representing the medical community, whether that be uh, from a physician standpoint or from uh, the hospital perspective or from even the insurance <coughs> industry, because obviously they're going to want to weigh in on consideration for negative outcomes, or as my attorney of de facto attorney on this committee would say negative consequences or what's the term that we coined? Extra or externalities. Negative externalities. Yes. Whoa. Yes, I know. <laughs> no. Big word. Big word. Um, but more to the point, um, I think Mr. Flaherty uh, said it best too. Uh, business groups should weigh in on this, both from a management as well as from labor. Um, both have uh, uh, key and important factors to consider with regard to um, how they will deal with um, the, the, the activities uh, if this were be, to become commercialized. I note that uh, you have agriculture on the list, but there is not uh, a representative education. And I think one of the, the best means of appreciating the opportunity in front of a person is by first being educated about it, whether that be in the E-12 or even at the higher ed or through uh, public service announcements. So would urge you to consider that. You know, we have a land grant institution who does a lot of research on substances, substance abuse, on the ethics of, of various um, uh, issues. And I would urge you to consider uh, include, including those as well. And because we are, and as was said in another committee that I was in today, we're getting older. <laughs> Not you, of course, no. but, um, <laughs> but I think about the aging population and how this might be a considerable um, uh, conversation for them to engage in, in terms of their use for such things as, uh, from a medical perspective, uh, dementia, Alzheimer's, which ties you back into the medical community as well as the University of Minnesota with the research. I think we've got a ready-made audience to be able to participate in the, the long-term, uh, both positive and negative effects of a substance of this nature. But we're also dealing in a federal environment too, so such agencies as CMS and DEA. Certainly they probably aren't you know, privy, or don't need to be privy to the, the, the council itself, but of, of council, uh, for what the, the federal government might view as uh, being a help versus a hindrance on this as well. Um, I'm certainly in favor of the discussion. I think it's something that we should take up as a state. But that being said, um, you're only availing yourself to five months. There is no date of enactment on the bill, and so by law, this would take enactment on the 1st of August and with a, a due date for that, uh, that report being the 1st of, of January, I think you're, sh you're shortchanging the task force in an immeasurable number of ways if we don't allow them to be pragmatic and thoughtful about including all voices on this subject. And so I would urge you to 
consider moving that out uh, so that everyone that has a party to this would have an opportunity to have their voice heard uh, in a thoughtful and, and positive manner. So thank you. Representative Mariani. Madam Chair, mm -hmm. Representative Albright, uh, all uh, very excellent uh, observations. Um, and actually, the, the last one actually caught me off guard. You're right. Yeah, enactment would, would default to uh, August 1st. Um, it, it's certainly the author's intent that we would begin this uh, almost immediately. Um, and so that, that could be an easy enough fix uh, uh, in terms of an amendment. Um, in terms of the number of, uh, not number, but the variety of people um, here, part of what I've been trying to balance off is creating as inclusive as possible a group without having like a thousand people in the room. <laughs> Um, you know, my wife and I both like to cook, but uh, believe me, uh, she's she's the chef. And if I try to be the chef at the same time she is, I, I get into lots of trouble. Um, I, I so part of I mean I, I will wrestle with this uh, for sure. Uh, you know, just quick observations. Absolutely, this this space, this overlap, you know, with uh, state authority and federal uh, authority is a big issue. Uh, it's one of the reasons uh, why we want uh, the Commission of Public Safety uh, to be there uh, with us. Whether that uh, will be enough to be able to uh, have a, a thorough enough deliberation relative to that uh, overlapping jurisdiction and even conflicting, um, you know, is something we'll, you know, I will continue to wrestle with and, 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 and try to think through. Um, we do have, uh, you know, a person with, you know, on lines 2.14, a person with experience in working in public health uh, policy. Uh, arguably, uh, we could add, uh, you know, more. That's just, that's one person. Uh, I do agree, uh, Mr. Flaherty had also indicated the need to, from his perspective, uh, to see uh, the medical community uh, present, whether this is going to be enough. Uh, um, I'm certainly open uh, to making sure that we have a strong uh, uh, medical uh, community uh, presence. Um, your observation on education is right on. We didn't capture that in this in terms of, you know, someone who's a teacher or principal or uh, superintendent of one of our schools. We did do an, uh, an important um, observation on, I think, important at 3.15. Uh, in terms of the education of the public on scientific knowledge uh, of the effects of cannabis, that gets a, a, a little bit at, at what you were suggesting in terms of tapping into our, our academicians and intelligentsia in the state. We've actually have conferred uh, with a few people in higher ed already. We had someone uh, earlier today at a related bill um, in committee uh, speaking on a Representative Quam bill relative to the science of testing uh, for driving impairedness. Uh, 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 that's an expert, a national expert who exists, resides at the University of Minnesota. Uh, so we certainly want to tap uh, those folks. This is a nod in that direction without naming uh, that person. Whether that's the right balance or not, I will continue to wrestle with that. Uh, that, that line also uh, uh, acknowledges that knowledge within the concept or within the value, or within paying attention to minors uh, as well. Uh, we heard a couple of testifiers uh, speak to that issue uh, as well. So um, I, I, I am more than open to continue to uh, reconfigure uh, this bill so that uh, we can get to the right balance of people that should be formally present uh, the right balance of issues that should be carefully vetted um, and try to do that in as practical a way as possible. Uh, my hope, quite frankly, is that if this is authorized, that this ta uh, task force and Representative Loeffler and I spoke about this a little bit yesterday, that it engage in a methodology that, um, you know, creates opportunities for it to um, break down, if you will, into very distinct groups that could do a little bit deeper dives in some of these areas. 
Um, you know, I, I spoke with Representative Loeffler about possibly even structuring that methodology uh, into the bill. Uh, it's a little unorthodox, uh, I think, but but if we go that route, I think the Government Ops uh, uh, Committee, if we're if it moves from here, would be a good place to do that as well as to answer some of these other issues. But my door is wide open to you, sir, and to others in terms of ideas and how we strengthen the voices at the table as well as the uh, the scope of the vital issues that, that it, it should cover. My last comment, um, uh, I addressed the, the, the beginning of it. Um, uh, the, the end report, um, you know, we, we've got it in January. The idea there was uh, to have something timely for the next legislative session. Um, I see both pros and cons about uh, moving, uh, you know, presumably if we start in June, we're talking seven, eight months. Uh, that's pretty fierce. Um, um, and on the other hand, there's also this very real uh, pressure and desire, um, you know, uh, that exists in the broader public for us to take some steps, uh, if not even fuller steps. So I'm trying to balance that off as well. Um, I will continue to wrestle with, with that. Representative Freiberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Chair Mariani, for uh, bringing this bill forward. Um, I do appreciate some of the changes you've made in the amendment uh, compared to the original version. Just looking through it, um, you know, if you look at some of the appointees of the governor starting at line 2.3, um, you know, I th you changed it to a person with expertise in the treatment of substance abuse disorder, the older version referenced um, cannabis addiction. I think the new language is better there. Just I think substance abuse disorder is a more um, recognized field. Um, you know, and on line 3.5 of the new version, you know, there is a reference to um, public health as one of the duties of the task force to study. Um, I know Mr. Sankey mentioned the, that there wasn't that much of a focus on health. And um, I think, you know, there wasn't in the older version. This at least has that reference. I think possibly could be expanded a little bit in the future um, just because uh, I think that's such an important aspect of this debate. You know, and as, and, you know, and, and as to the date, I noticed this version did actually bring it back uh, to January 1st, the older version said, had said February 1st is right. when the report was due. I actually think that's a good thing. Um, I think maybe you want to look at, um, just having it not default to August 1st, but having it convene at an earlier date or upon upon enactment. So there is a little bit more time, but I think getting a report by January 1st uh, would be a good thing just so that, you know, I, I would hope we can still have a discussion about it this year, but in the we are getting close to deadline. In the event we're not, um, I do think it will be good to have a report well in advance of next year's legislative session, which I assume will be sometime in late February um, is when it'll start as it generally does in the even years. Um, so, you know, and I was impressed that the, all the testifiers spoke in favor of this. I think that says something to the work you've done. I, I you know, just having done some work in this area over the last year, um, it seems like there's a huge diversity of views. Um, so the fact that there seems to be a general alignment around this task force idea um, is encouraging. I do think some of the testifiers had some good suggestions that you may want to consider. Uh, Mr. Flaherty, you know, suggested more focus from a treatment perspective. Ms. Schroeder would add a person who was previously incarcerated. Uh, Mr. Anderson suggested that there be a member who's in addiction recovery. Uh, Mr. Sankey, as I mentioned, pointed out that there weren't that many health positions or duties related to health, health in there. Uh, Mr. Harkis suggested that there be more consumers. I think those are all ideas worth Looking at, I mean, you did mention, I, I'm sensitive to your comment that you don't want a thousand people on the task force, and I actually totaled, added them all up here, and there are currently, it looks like under the amendment, there would be 32 members, which is a pretty big task force, and it's going to be hard to get consensus <laughs> with a group that size. Um, if you are looking to shave a few off, I, it does seem to be a little heavy on the bureaucrats and the politicians, um, so I counted about 20 um, either elected officials or representatives of agencies, that might be a little heavy. Um, I think the governor's appointments in there is a more diverse body. 
Uh, there were eight there and there were four members of the law enforcement community, which obviously is important to have at the table, I think, as well. Um, so, like I said, if, you know, if you're looking for an area to maybe shave off a few members so it doesn't get too unwieldy, I'd suggest maybe the, the politicians and the bureaucrats. Um, you know, and uh, this bill does have another stop. I think those sorts of discussions are, are well within the jurisdiction of the Government Operations Committee, which looks to bills related to task forces. So, appreciate your work on this. Thank you. Representative Pearson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair uh, and uh, Representative Chair Mariani. Um, I, I guess I, I think um, Representative Albright really touched on one of my thoughts that was that I wanted to comment on, and that's again this interplay between the federal government, and I, I think where it's actually missing the most is in the duties. Like we, we know other states have done this, but we need to make sure that we're not doing anything that, that gets our state into further trouble if we're counting on this revenue for specific funding models and then the federal government comes in and says, you can't do that. Um, I think that interplay is something we need to make sure we're fully aware of and I think that should be a duty within the task force as well. Um, but then looking like Representative Freiberg was just saying, you know, you we've got this membership and you know it's a long list of commissioners and then other other interested parties and and yes there are i mean probably too many legislators in there but um <laughs> apparently we always think we're very important so that happens a lot um but is there a reason that that this task force can't be established within the governor's office the the uh the establishments here, but but again within the executive branch, they have that capacity to to create this type of a entity or a body. Um, you know, we aren't paying any of these folks anything. We're asking the commissioners of health to provide the support staff, office space, and administration. I do notice you you throw them fifty thousand dollars in the in fiscal year twenty twenty, which is appropriated from the general fund. Um, but I, I, I guess I, I'm curious if, if it's just something that could just have been, just as easily been established through the executive branch, researched and, and uh, uh, basically we're gonna probably see the same players and, and in individuals participating. Um, it's a long list of the executive branch with the exception of a few, of a few legislators that I think are not necessarily the most impactful anyway. So uh, I'm, I'm just curious if that's been pursued or considered. Chair Mariani. Yeah, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, Representative uh, Pearson. Uh, two things, uh, uh, I've, I've noted the, the uh, suggestion of, of, uh, of being explicit about the duties relative to federal and state um, overlap uh, of, of Authority and just general issues, and I think there's a lot of wisdom in that um, uh, recommendation about being very intentional uh, to address that issue. Um, and I'll certainly consider uh, adding that in, under the duties part. Um, in terms of your uh, your question, I I don't know of any legal bar for the governor to put together uh, uh, for a governor to put together his or her uh, task force. Um, um, on, on this line. Um, I, I know the governor has expressed support for our effort here, uh, and so perhaps that might be a further conversation depending on whether or not this uh, body um, uh, acts. Uh, obviously, an acting means that the Senate needs to act uh, with us. Uh, I do have a, a companion bill uh, in the Senate um, and uh, all I can say is that, uh, you know, my intention here is that, you know, as a member of the legislature, I think we ought to act and um, offering us an opportunity uh, to exercise our equal um, ability to act uh, as the legislative branch. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I'm encouraging. Uh, but uh, really, technically, to answer your question, I don't, I don't think there's anything that bars the governor uh, from creating something like this. 
with this, you know, this kind of uh, uh, recommendation um, uh, back to him uh, in the executive branch. Um, um, but again, you know, my desire is uh, for us to act and uh, um, uh, and then see what happens when uh, the if the bill is successful and we meet with the governor. Representative Peterson. And I, I appreciate that, and, and thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I don't expect you to speak on behalf of the governor's office, but I, I'm actually wondering if there's anybody in the audience that that can speak to whether or not the governor is considering this type of a um, of a panel or or task force or anything of that nature. If that's uh, you know, as as this bill moves forward, I'd, I'd hate to have it not travel in one of the two bodies uh, to its destination and and uh, all this work uh, be scrapped. I, I, I don't know if there's anybody here who can. Is there anyone here from the governor, governor's office? Very good, then. I appreciate the question, and uh, thank you, Chair Mariani. Or, Chair Mariani, yeah. Thank you, right. Representative. Uh, Representative New. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative Mariani. I really do appreciate this as a probably a more thoughtful approach to this issue than some of the others we've seen. Um, especially, frankly, when it comes to, you know, on, on page three, th this issue of expungement of nonviolent marijuana convictions. Clearly, we've got an issue that needs to be dealt with, particularly as it affects, you know, disproportionately persons of color. That's clearly an issue that we really do need to resolve. I, I have a little bit of concern and reservation about, um, about um, what the task force will ultimately produce. Um, there was discussion about, you know, this is a good way to evaluate the pros and cons, which I completely agree with. Um, I think it's important that we recognize that there are indeed cons. Um, and my, my concern is that um, the task force is going to e effectively, I mean, they are going to tell us how we should legislate this. Of course, as legislators, we get to make the final decision on that. I'm a little concerned, however, that, that those recommendations will be made. And then uh, on page three, lines 3.25 3 and 2.26, or 3.26, theoretically, I suppose the recommendation to the legislature could be made that this isn't a good idea. However, with lines 3.8 to that point, it seems that they're going to tell us how we should do it, um, which I think is a little bit contradictory. That, that's I think that that we are going to be led to believe that we should do, take these actions, even though it might not be a great idea. Um, on the point of on the point of who should be on the commission, just to put a little bit finer point on it particularly with medical personnel. Um, I think we're lacking someone like a neurologist, um, someone who understands the effects on the brain. Um, I also think as, as far as business groups go, just to give you an example, I've actually had someone talk to me who is a small business owner um, who employs forklift operators. And she has a great deal of concern about how this might affect um, her business, particularly if this is legalized, particularly with um, without a mechanism in place. You know, like for, for alcohol, obviously we have mechanisms in place to, to test for that. There are breathalyzer tests, we can, we can determine that immediately. With marijuana, we don't currently have those mechanisms in place. Um, and so, you know, speaking to this one business owner, that was a significant concern. Uh, so so I, would, I, I just mentioned that to, to just uh, put a finer point on this idea of perhaps including the business community and how this might affect them. So thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and uh, Representative Mariani. I think it's good for us to get ahead of this issue and to take advantage of the learning of states that have gone ahead of us who have sometimes run into unexpected problems and issues that they didn't anticipate and that we can learn from. And so I'm glad that one of the first duties of the task force is to, to look at what 
uh, the advices of others who have gone before us and what's worked well and what hasn't. Um, this committee is the, the health committee has looked a lot at issues related to um, health impacts of products. And for example, one of the things that I think was a really good step forward, and I think it was Representative Freiberg who brought it to us, was when um, electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes first came on the market um, and we needed to start to create a regulatory framework around them. He suggested, and we put into law, that there be childproof uh, containers for the liquid that is vaped. Mm -hmm. And we have avoided the problems that other states have had with tremendous calls into poison information centers with kids that got into those wonderful fruity flavored things that were never meant for anyone to, to drink. Um, and I think with the edibles and other issues, you know, those kind of issues, we're going to want to look at, you know, and also the marketing. We've heard a lot in this committee about the marketing that targets youth, no matter what our laws say, um, on tobacco, on vaping, on the new jewel products, that sort of thing. And so we want to make sure that this happens. This is a huge lift, as almost everyone who's talked and testified has indicated. And to me, the best example of a huge lift that was done effectively um, using the best expertise in Minnesota was the 2007 effort on health care reform um, through the Health Care Reform Task Force in Minnesota, in which we divided up into work groups, each headed by a member of the full task force. Um, and um, out of that came, um, and I can't even remember everything, but the medical homes, which people in this committee are familiar with, where we incentivize primary care coordination. Um, they, uh, there was efforts in small business uh, group insurance reform. There was health improvements um, and cost reduction work group that led to our statewide health improvement program. Um, I think that led to the adoption of legislation statewide regarding the adoption of electronic health records and how that would lead to coordinated care. And what, in looking back on that, what I think was the magic of it is because we broke into work groups, we could get people with incredible expertise to volunteer their time and energy to come to the table who would never have been on something that was seven months of bi-weekly meetings on mostly on topics that they're not involved with. And so we got experts from the university, I bet on every single one of those work groups. We had actuaries who bill out at you know $400 an hour or something who were willing to be on an insurance reform work group, but who would never have been on a broader group. And so as you go forward into uh, the Government Operations Committee, I would really think you should think about that, having a, a coordinating body a, a, that everyone reports to, so all the insights go to the decision makers and the final recommenders, um, but you actually have some active work groups, because I think you're going to find researchers across our higher ed system who would love to step up, um, that there are others who have a lot more experience in chemical dependency and um, other areas who would step up for a bit of the work, but not the whole thing. And so um, that's my recommendation is, as you move forward, because we did a lot and in a summer work group um, situation, but it was because we divided up the work and invited a lot more people to the table. The other thing is if you stay with the current task force, I would really look at the list and say, who here could be a resource rather than a voting member? Um, and that they would come in and bring their expertise um, on an advisory panel or when that topic's discussed, but they don't need to be at every meeting. Okay. So we're having some really robust discussion here. Um, we have two more testifiers. Mary Ani, you have a bill up in another committee. I do. So it seems like it's coming up like now. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> so I don't know if a Representative Backer needs to speak to anything, and then we have Pinto. No, none for Pinto. I just, I'll be real brief. Thank you, Chair. Um, I had quite lengthy, but in time. My biggest concern, I know you're trying to be very diligent at this, and I appreciate that. But this is, this is the main reason I cannot support this, is, is this I see as a gateway to legalize marijuana. And as an EMT, I've been on a number of runs that people have been affected by this product, um, this illegal product that we're looking at illegalizing. So I do appreciate the effort that you're trying to do to dot the I's and cross the T's, but I just ha let you know that I just see this as a pathway to legalize marijuana f and, and I can't support that. So that's all I, I will say due to time. I, I respect your perspective, sir. 
Okay, so what we're going to do now, because I know you have a bill up and we had uh, some great discussion, I would like to um, uh, renew um, my motion to House File 717 as amended, be recommended for re referral to the Committee on Government Operation. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? No. Uh, aye. The motion prevails, and House File 717 as amended is recommended for re referral. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the conversation Thank you. as well. Okay, Representative Anderson. <laughs> Representative Commerce. Thank you. Representative Anderson, would you like to move the bill? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, I would. Um, I would like to have it uh, re referred to the Committee of Commerce. Okay, Representative Anderson moves um, the oh, House File 776. Uh, do you have an author's amendment? Also? I do, um, Madam Chair. I would also like to move the A5 amendment, and I can actually walk through the A5 amendment because um, my bill has become a little bit of a vehicle for other things. So, okay. It's, well, so, Senator Anderson moves uh, the A5 author's amendment. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion prevails and the amendment is adopted. So, can you please Here, present your bill? Thank you, Madam Chair. House Bill 766 amends our existing medical cannabis law with the intent of improving access and affordability for patients. This law was passed overwhelmingly with bipartisan, on a bipartisan basis in 2014. Since then, thousands of Minnesotans suffering from cancer, HIV, Crohn's disease, and other qualifying conditions have found relief from medical cannabis. When I was door knocking last year, I met many, many patients in my district and family members that told me stories of how their pain have ended, appetites have been restored, and other positive benefits using medical cannabis. Our program, this program in the state of Minnesota is helping people, but some modifications are needed to allow it to help more. Too many patients can't afford to pay for their medicine with out of pocket dispenser, with out of pockets not being covered by insurance, and also the limited number of dispensaries that make it a challenge for, especially for those in rural Minnesota. House File 766 won't fix every problem patients face, but this bill takes some important and positive steps to address affordability and incre increase access. I'd like to walk through the bill so everyone is clear on what it does. Sections 1, 2, and 7 were removed for the, in the author's amendments. These provisions would have allowed students um, to access their medicine on schools. There are eight states that currently allow this to happen, um, but in working with some of the school organizations and educators, we realized that this is something that we're going to have to work on over the summer. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than just getting it done this year. But I do uh, remain dedicated to making sure that we, we actually address that issue. Section 3 addresses a problem that is happening both rural Minnesota as well as here in the, in the metro. Current law provides patients must see a licensed health professional who certifies that they have a qualifying condition. I think that's appropriate, but the law also requires that patients see a healthcare practitioner again if they need to renew their license, which must be done on an annual basis. Many, many of the qualifying conditions are chronic, such as ALS, Tourette's, and epilepsy, and they will not have gone away over the course of a year. It doesn't make sense to force patients with mobility issues and other challenges to have to travel and pay to see a clinician who will confirm that what everybody already knows, that their disease is chronic and it won't be cured. Section 3 allows patients renewing their enrollment to do it via telemedicine, which will make life easier for them. Uh, currently, we've seen the legislature this year expand on telemedicine, and this would uh, just bring the, the statute um, to match some of those other laws that are being worked on. Current law allows one dispensary in each congressional district. This means some patients must travel great distances to access their medicine. Section 4 provides that each manufacturer can add a second dispensary site, which would double the number in the state. This won't solve the travel problems for everyone, particularly those in the 1st, 7th, and 8th congressional districts but it will help. I know that some want to add more dispensaries, but there are economic challenges in adding brick and mortar sites without, much lar without, much, without a much larger program. My goal is to add more dispensaries in the future as we get more patients enrolled. Section 5 allows the two manufacturers to share products and sell to each other's, sell each other's medicines. This is helpful for a couple of reasons. First, it expands the choices available to patients. There may be particular strain that helps a patient, but it isn't sold by a, a specific manufacturer. And there's only two in the state of Minnesota, just to be clear. 
Um, this provision would allow the patient access to access the medicine that is best for them and closer to home. It also provides an insurance policy for patients should a disaster hit their manufacturer. If a fire or tornado destroyed a manufacturer's growing and processing facility, it would allow them to continue to get the medicine, um, being able to work with the other dispensary. Sections 8 and 9 were removed in the author's amendment because they are moving separately in the tax committee. Um, Current law prohibits two manufacturers prohibits the two manufacturers from deducting their normal business expenses, and so that will be uh, addressed there. Um, section 10, uh, well, it, it will be addressed there, but it will also allow them to deduct their business expenses. Section 10 addresses a problem that has gone on for years. Pa patients enrolling in the program pay a fee for their enrollment card, and two manufacturers pay an annual licensing fee. <coughs> These revenues are dedicated to the Office of Medical Cannabis and the Department of Health, so it can hire staff that it needs to oversee the program. However, these funds have not been appropriated from the Special Revenue Fund to the department. As a result, the office is severely understaffed and unable to meet the needs of patients. Um, patients may sit on hold for extended periods of time and have to wait months to get their enrollment cards when they need them now. Some advocacy organizations, I believe a few of them are actually here today, um, have been picking up the slack to serve as clearing houses for patients, which is not what the law intended. Meanwhile, we have several million dollars sitting in an account. This provision appropriates just over four million over the next two years to the office so that it can hire staff it needs to serve patients and manage the program. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and I'd like to move to my first testifier because she is a mom and she needs to get home to her child. So. Um, uh, rep or sorry, I was going to call you representative. Okay. Shannon Johnson, a mom. <clears throat> Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Shannon Johnson, and I'm here on behalf of my son. Um, for the past 14 years, our family has become conversational in the unwritten language of autism. Through our son, we've learned cues and create coping mechanisms each time we decode a shutdown, a meltdown, or an outburst. We read body language and pick up keywords and expression to know what our son JJ is struggling with. Though he can answer some questions, he's never been able to come to us and say, I don't feel good, I'm hungry, or I'm tired. He's never been able to advocate for himself in nearly all aspects of his life. As a mother who did everything right, I sit year after year around tables filled with doctors, specialists, teachers, and therapists, and experience the very raw reality of our child. He's made some progress, but it's not as much as we'd like to see. I have the same flood of feelings, heartbreak, and failure, no matter how well I prepare myself. Our son has subjected himself faithfully to years of therapy, chiropractors, groups, holistic and conventional doctors, different diets, and so much more, pushing himself to the limit in a world that is made up of everything difficult for autism. Along with Johnny, we have another child who isn't on the spectrum but suffers from debilitating anxiety. He has real life panic attacks where he can't breathe, he vomits, he has diarrhea, he cries, and he completely shuts down. At the age of eight, following an episode at a well check, we left the doctor's office with an unsolicited prescription for Xanax for my eight-year-old. He's gone to therapies and medical professionals as well. And eventually we were told to just back down and put him on medication. This is something that we've been determined to avoid. Med after med, failure after failure, we got to the point where our then nine-year-old was on three different medications to counteract all the side effects from just one ADHD and anxiety medication. I've stood for years in front of our oldest son with autism, JJ's classes, and I've presented PowerPoints to help bridge the communication gap between him and his peers and to help end different. Um, just to have people see him, have his peers see him as just another kid. In every single presentation I've given, I say people with autism are like friends that speak a different language. They think, they feel, they have the same interests, they do everything that we do, they just struggle with communication. I've also presented saying, if you feel sad or you feel scared, you can go to a doctor and you can, you can get medication to help with that. Um, and people are the only thing that can help autism. Um, but for us, everything in that speech changed in October of 2018. After struggling um, for years of progress, um, increasing behaviors and rigidity were we were again cornered to try some ADHD and anxiety meds for him, even though he has autism. Because of the medication failures we've gone through and are still going through with his brother, we started asking other autism parents for advice. We were very reluctant uh, and went to an appointment to discuss medical cannabis. I'm an average sized person, but I'm a huge mama bear. Um, and I raked that doctor over the coals and I threw every question, concern, and skepticism that we had at her. 
She fielded them without missing a beat and put our minds in a position that no other professional ever has. We started, uh, we started him with the high CBD, um, lowest THC dose, and I hovered over him like a hawk, watching and waiting for the failure we've become so familiar with. Every day seemed to yield better results, and JJ became less rigid, less verbally explosive, and happier in general. After about two weeks, I asked the same question I'd been asking from his first dose. Do you feel any different? This is a question that's never been answered by him with clarity before. And he looked at me and he said, Mom, see this. I can't do it because I'll get vertigo. But he shook his head up and down and all around. And he said, it doesn't hurt anymore. This is hard for me, sorry. And I asked, what didn't hurt? He says, my head. Reciprocal conversation at this point was a new territory for us. And so I said, did your, hurt, your head hurt this morning? And he said, no, Mom, every time I wake up in the morning, my head hurts, but it doesn't anymore. And he shouted, I'm a new man. <laughs> and he kind of toe sprung, um, walked away, and he was whistling. And I started crying because I had no idea that his head hurt every single day. He wasn't able to articulate that to us. Um, I cried because it was for the first time in his life that he was actually able to advocate for himself. Um, I began receiving calls from his school that he must be maturing, he's having um, better days, that he's not perseverating on small problems that he has, um, that we didn't need social stories for the holidays, and that he's able to be in the room with kids that he'd historically shut down just seeing, and further not even reacting to their behaviors. Then I received a call from the school social worker that I've waited so long to answer. He reported for the first time since third grade, um, Johnny's in eighth grade, that he had made progress on his social goals. And so whatever we were doing, we needed to keep doing that because it's working. I decided to put our conservative secret aside and share with the school exactly what we had been doing. And they were surprised, but they welcomed it because they see um, the benefits that it has had. I'm here today to share how life-changing this has been for our family. I'm here to send my plea to open medical cannabis up to more conditions, mm -hmm. allow it to be administered in schools, and try to make it more cost-effective so I don't have to work a second job to be able to afford it. I desperately need that time with my family. Our son is living proof that this works. He's able to recall his day, which is something he's never been able to do. He has greater body awareness and no longer binge eats, which seems like ironic. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> it does. Um, he's no longer trapped inside of his own mind. Um, he's able to um, have reciprocal conversations. He's amazing, and he's finally starting to project all the years of hard work that he's put in in largely in part of the medical cannabis that he has had zero side effects from. He needed this. Our other son needs this. So many people need this but don't qualify, but it works. Please think of our once silent child's journey as you carefully consider bills related to medical cannabis. Thank you for your testimony. I understand you need to leave. Do members have any questions for our testifier before she goes? Thank you very much. Madam Chair, I just wanted to share how I met um, Mrs. Johnson. I was visiting one of the dispensaries to see how the medicines were dispensed. And she says, I want to speak to the state legislator. Let this, the, and so she came and she, she spoke to me about how um, impactful it's been for her family. So I'm glad that she was able to join us. Thanks. My next testifier, uh, Madam Chair, will be Jeremy Sankey, uh, Minnesota Veterans for Cannabis. It looks like you're coming up. Please state your name again for the record and proceed with your testimony. Madam Chairwoman, it's Jeremy Sankey, Minnesota Veterans for Cannabis. Okay. Um, my organization is in uh, support of this bill. Um, we like the fact that um, the bill does improve um, access. Um, for many veterans in the state of Minnesota, access or accessibility is a very huge thing. Um, several veterans have to travel hours away uh, just to get to a dispensary. Uh, can you imagine if you know you had to travel two hours to get to the local Walgreens to get your script filled by a doctor that was five minutes away from you? Um, this bill, um, although it doesn't address all the accessibility issues, does a lot. Um, there's a lot of uh, with the increased manufacturing stuff in this bill, 
Um, that could lead to uh, <clears throat> reduced prices or affordability for the program. Many of the things that veterans uh, struggle with is uh, being able to afford uh, the cost of the state program, uh, which could be hundreds every month. And uh, they struggle with that because they know they can go back to the VA and get um, hundreds of pills for free every month. Um, so I want to thank Rep Representative Edelson on everything she's doing with this bill. And uh, hopefully we can get it through, um, do everything we can to help veterans and at the same time um, help as many civilians who uh, could benefit from the program. And um, I, I hope that if we can help more veterans, we'll be able to do everything we can for everybody. I mean, because that's why I became a veteran. That's why I became a soldier was to defend people who couldn't defend themselves. So if I can help or if my organization can help to defend um, other people that can benefit from this program, um, we're all in. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, the next is Katie um, cummings Baco is on the list, it looks like. Today. <laughs> Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Hi, my name is Katie Cummins Baco, and I have been a medical cannabis patient since the spring of 2016. I have a connective tissue disease called Ehlers Danlos Syndrome, and, uh, or EDS, we call it. Um, it is gaining a lot of awareness lately, a lot, of, a lot more people. 394 West. Sorry. Oh, I was like, I don't think that's me. I've done that before, though. Um, a lot of people are gaining awareness about my disease, but what most people don't know about EDSers is that we have um, so many other comorbidities that go along with the diagnosis. In addition to chronic pain, muscle spasms, and joint dislocations caused by EDS, I also have mast cell disease, uh, postural arthrostatic tachycardia syndrome, small fiber neuropathy, tethered cord syndrome, intractable headaches, sleep problems, and those are just a few of my issues. I stopped counting my surgeries after around number 22, but my first was at age seven, and my next is in Washington, D.C. for my tethered cord, uh, my tethered spinal cord. I've been unable to work since 2014, I have my master's degree in social work and used to be a public school social worker. I've had more doctor's appointments than I have social engagements. I'm here to testify because while any improvements to our medical program are positive, they're never enough. I used to go to one dispensary until it seemed I have developed a tolerance to the products they provide. I can't really tell what's going on with it though because we're not allowed to know which products we're getting. It's only labeled as THC or CBD. I went to the other dispensary and their CBD, though it's um, indicated for my mast cell disease, um, it made me sick. Again, I'm not allowed to know what's in it besides CBD, so I can't tell what of that product is actually making me sick. So I'm not, a, I'm not sure what I'm supposed to be avoiding from that particular dispensary. For a while, I was going to both dispensaries, getting my CBD from one dispensary and getting my THC from the other dispensary. But if I were to take the, um, the medications from both dispensaries that the pharmacy, pharmacists at the dispensaries were recommending, it was costing me over $750 a month. And that's not including the actual prescribed medications that I'm taking as well. So now I get my THC from one of the dispensaries and my CBD from a local store that one of my friends owns. We talk about eating whole foods as a way of healthy living, but we're providing our patients with a processed product. That to me is a problem. My son is actually sitting over there. I brought him for the learning experience, and he has the same disease I do. Um, without the transparency of the product that I'm putting into my system, I'm very uncomfortable putting it into his. 
Um, he actually has worse mast cell issues than I do and for the first five years of his life was unable to eat food at all by mouth. And so now to put a, pro a medication product into his system when I'm not allowed to know the ingredients in it beyond CBD is very scary to me. So I'm not willing to put him on the program. And we need to redefine the real problems with our medical program as they stand right now. This bill does very little improve people's lives. I'm not going to advocate against it. I think the things that are in it are wonderful, but it's just not enough. And I have to ask who we're really looking out for. I've sat through the other hearing prior to this and now listening to this. I just, patients aren't centered in any of the things that we're discussing here. I got off 200 milligrams of Oxycontin and Codone a day. I had been on that for almost six years of my life. Cannabis was my exit drug. I didn't use anything. I was told I would not be able to do it without methadone or suboxone, and I used only cannabis. And I hope people that are um, voting against these things about cannabis are listening, because it's really important to me that people realize that cannabis is an exit drug, and it kept me from dying, and patients are not being listened to. When I was asked where I thought I'd be without cannabis, the only thing I can say is I would be dead. I was being told to take 200 milligrams of Oxycontin and Codone a day. I was driving on that amount of medication. And now I'm not, I'm bright eyed and I'm clear headed and I'm able to live my life in a much better way. It's no secret that I'm in favor of full legalization because it's saving lives. It's not taking them. It gave me my life back. I'm for full legalization not only because I believe it will drastically improve our medical program and lives depend on it, but also because we, are in, we so desperately need to address the disparities in the racial equity, in racial equity with the war on drugs. We need our leaders here to listen and to stand up and be as brave as we patients are. I hope you'll work as hard as we have in saving lives and protecting ourselves. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your testimony. You have another testifier, Representative? You know, I just, I'm just reading from the list. Oh, so, well, I mean, you I have started enough. introducing them, so you can continue if you want. Oh, sure. No, I'll absolutely. <laughs> uh, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, Marin uh, Schroeder is the next person on the list. Can we call the next testifier down as well, please? Representative Edelson. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? Can we call the next testifier, Donna? Oh, yes, please? absolutely. Um, Joan Barron would be the next person if you want to come. And then Aaron Chase, if you want to come sit behind here, too, that would be great. Please state your name again for the record and proceed with your testimony. My name is Marin Schroeder, and I'm president of Sensible Minnesota. Um, as I mentioned before, we're a 501c3 that has been working with medical cannabis patients since implementation of um, our current program. We've worked one-on-one -on -one with over 500 patients during that time, and we have a patient group with over 700 members. Uh, we have spent the last couple of years expanding access to medical cannabis in Minnesota uh, with pe successful petitions for the inclusion of post-traumatic stress disorder, autism spectrum disorder, and now Alzheimer's disease. Over the past four years, we've had the opportunity to talk with thousands of patients, both registered and not. Many of those patients have had success, and I want to be clear that we don't think the two existing manufacturers are doing a bad job. Um, I'm going to clarify the rest of what I have to say with that. Um, but what we need to see is more attention to patients and patient access than the, than the needs of the industry itself. Minnesota's patient numbers are a fraction of where they should be. As of Friday, February 28th, there were 15,331 patients currently enrolled and over 7,000 patients who were at one time registered but either dropped their enrollment, likely due to high costs, or they passed away. 
According to the January 2019 Medical Cannabis Program update published by the Office of Medical Cannabis, consistently from July to December of 2018, fewer than 11,000 of those 15,000 patients purchased from a state registered manufacturer. Um, to compare our patient numbers, um, New York and Pennsylvania both uh, worked from Minnesota's model and improved it. They both implemented after us. Um, they both have around 100,000 patients each. Were we to adjust that for the population, that is over 40,000 patients under New York's model and over 70,000 patients under Pennsylvania's. The patients aren't registering because they know the medicine is cost prohibitive. We appreciate the intent of this bill, which will improve geographic accessibility and might begin to scratch the surface of affordability, but it doesn't go far enough. We don't see how this cost will substantially bring down costs to levels in, remotely in line with other medical cannabis states like Arizona and Illinois, or even recreational states like Washington and Oregon. Minnesota's prices are substantially higher than other markets, as demonstrated by the prices associated with the high quality 500 milliliter or milligram cartridge. Um, I provided the committee a handout showing the price of comparable products in Illinois, Arizona, Washington, and Oregon that range from six to nine cents per milligram. In Minnesota, a cartridge from Leafline Labs costs $73, which is 18 cents per milligram. Minnesota Medical Solutions sells their cartridges with only 250 milligrams of THC for $59 or 24 cents per milligram. Both companies do offer discounts, that's great, but when the, when the base price is four to six times, the, the discounts can't, can't do enough. <coughs> Patients in other states have access to more than two companies and they're allowed to consume raw cannabis material, which is the most cost-effective way to get medicine to our patients and supplements the cost of producing more expensive medical cannabis products. Unfortunately, we fail to see how this bill meaningfully addresses the grossly ob obscene cost issue. Um, the bill also fails to address a number of major barriers to accessibility, including a conflict in the current law that prohibits a patient from being a caregiver and a caregiver from being a patient. Um, I see Nell's nodding at me because I've talked to him about that before. Uh, patients on probation and conditional release may not be able to use medical cannabis based on the county judge, probation officer that they see. Um, and patients who are on parole with the Department of Corrections cannot use at all. They will be sent to prison. We know two patients that have, at least two patients have been. Employers are still firing patients for using medical cannabis as permitted by the program, despite protection from discrimination, because that protection has no legal teeth. There's no clause for attorney's fees or back pay. We still arbitrarily include qualifiers for cancer patients and those with terminal illness. Isn't cancer enough of a diagnosis to get access to medical cannabis? And we're not effectively using medical cannabis as a tool to reduce opioid use until we add chronic pain and, and let anybody that is using opiates use medical cannabis. Um, our team has met with Representative Edelson and we understand she's busy. What was frustrating to us was last week I was actually directed to an industry lobbyist. Um, leading up to this hearing, and I think that was a big missed opportunity to make meaningful improvements on behalf of the patients. Um, so it's my hope she'll work with us to make some of these other amendments um, to improve access for the tens of thousands of patients currently left behind. Um, we would like to see immediate substantial amendments to this bill. This, this is an urgent issue, guys. Uh, we need to address the accessibility issues previously outlined, remove excessive and costly requirements for manufacturer operation, amend the definition of medical cannabis to permit raw cannabis material, open up the market to additional producers and remove the vertical integration mandate to allow for more in organic in industry growth, and expand the number of patients eligible by adding chronic pain in any condition for which an opioid could otherwise be prescribed. Um, as an aside, um, I, there was talk about the appropriation to the Office of Medical Cannabis and we were mentioned we are currently handling an average of five to ten calls per day um, from patients referred from or that cannot get the information they need through the Office of Medical Cannabis. Their primary inquiry is how to find a, is how to find a certifying provider, how to talk to their doctor about enrolling them in the program. Um, OMC cannot share provider information with patients, but we have been able to compile an unofficial list as 
an outside entity. Um, so our volunteers are currently running themselves ragged and we would ask that during the process, the committees consider providing an appropriation for OMC to issue grants to organizations like ours who are picking up the slack for, for the state of Minnesota right now. Um, we encourage you all to work on substantial amendments to this bill to meaningful, meaningfully address the accessibility, affordability, patient protections, and justice. Our patients deserve it and should come before the industry and trust. Thank you for your time today, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you for your testimony. I think we'll do the next testifier, and then we'll have questions at the end. Thank you. John Barron? Okay. Yes. Welcome to the committee. Please state your name Hi. and proceed to the testimony. Yep. My name is Joan Barron. I'm from Ramsey, Minnesota, and I'm a patient in the medical cannabis program. I appreciate everything that you're trying to accomplish with HF 766. It's close to addressing the high out-of-pocket costs we as patients have to pay, not to mention the low enrollment numbers. Right now, thousands of Minnesotans are being denied access due to the cost or they have been forced onto the illicit market in order to choose a safer alternative in the midst of the opiate epidemic. I have been living in intractable pain for 18 years. I was diagnosed at Mayo with having pudental nerve entrapment. The main motor and sensory nerve of my pelvis got entrapped between two supporting ligaments of the pelvis after a fall off my front step. The condition causes burning, searing, rectal, and vaginal pain along with deep buttocks pain. Mayo could only offer me three CT guided nerve blocks in 2001. My only other course of treatment was flying to France to have decompression transposition surgery. I made four other trips for ketamine infusions and second opinions. I traveled off and on to San Francisco to see the president of the International Pelvic Pain Society and his women's health PT for two plus years. I have had L5-S1 fused. I have had numerous injections, too many to count. I've tried acupuncture, prolotherapy, chiropractor appointments, cranial sacral therapy, spinal catheters, all while being prescribed opiates, narcotics, anti-seizure medications, and depression meds. Within six months of my fall, I had a cupboard full of Oxycontin, several boxes of fentanyl patches, and everything in between. I kept all of our medications in the kitchen cupboard alongside the Tylenol and Advil. I hated taking them. I was not taking them as prescribed, nor was I counting my meds. I was never told to, not until I was placed in a pain clinic. That was about two years after my fall. I remember the doctors in France blown away by the fact I was even prescribed methadone. They only prescribed it for heroin addicts. I have two children. Katie, who was 20 at, at the time of my fall, and Adam, he was 16 the time of my fall. We started noticing changes in Adam's behavior, skipping school, not doing his homework. We busted him drinking with friends a couple of times. Some of the same stuff my husband and I did as kids. I thought it was just a phase. We took him to a doctor, we took him to a child psychologist, we put him on a low dose of antidepressants after the phase wouldn't pass. By the time I was enrolled into an accredited pain clinic, it was too late. By the time I realized I was supposed to be counting and keeping count of my meds, it was too late. By the time I realized my son had been sharing, stealing my meds, he had already gone to the streets of Minneapolis buying heroin. My child was a heroin addict, and I, his mother, was in chronic, intractable, chronic pelvic pain, who without those meds would have ended my life long ago. That's how bad this pain is. Over the course of 14 and a half years, I watched my son go from a smart, funny, kind young man to watching him go through detox after detox, rehab after rehab, overdose after overdose. We kicked him out, we brought him back in. We kicked him out, we brought him back in. We even pressed charges against him when he stole things from us, from bank checks to gold coins. We were told he needed to hit rock bottom, that that was the only way to make him stop. All it did was make matters worse for him, and it made matters worse for us. On October 22nd, 
21, 2014, I picked up my son from the Elk River Jail. He had been locked up for 32 days on a probation violation at the time. We had Adam back in the house. He, was, he had contracted hepatitis C. He was having numerous seizures and had track marks up and down both arms. It was a beautiful fall day. The sky with the bluest blue. I fixed his favorite supper, threw my purse in the corner, hurriedly putting groceries away. He said he was exhausted and just wanted to go downstairs to sleep. He had been hospitalized during that time in jail. He had the longest seizure he'd ever had and was taken to Mercy Hospital in Coon Rapids. I can't even put into words what that one fall did to our family. The price we have paid was ultimate. My son never came back up those stairs. On October 22nd, 2014, my son died in our downstairs family room. He had taken two or three of my methadone and injected it into his arm. He died from a methadone overdose, my methadone. I suffer from PTSD. To make matters worse, I have also developed obstructive defecation syndrome. I cannot take a ball movement without horrendous pain. Since entering the medical cannabis program, I have reduced my methadone from 80 milligrams three times a day to one 10 milligram tab. But I still need my breakthrough meds. Fortunately, I'm able to receive both. My pain clinic is working with me. The large majority of patients, they're not even allowed to do that. You have to choose one or the other. The high cost is hindering my ability to get off these medications that killed my son. Every day I have to look at the bottle of methadone knowing what it did to our family. It took my son from me forever. We can do better than this in Minnesota. Right now there are thousands of pills out there. What happened to our family has happened to other households and it's still happening. We are losing a generation to the opiate epidemic. Give us the right to choose a safer alternative and make that alternative affordable so that it's accessible and everyone in the state can choose a safer alternative. HF 766 does not go far enough in addressing the cost and accessibility of medical cannabis. The fewer opiates on the street means the less chance of having them fall into the wrong hands and die. That doesn't happen with medical cannabis, ever. My grandson is now the age that my son was. He's 15, and I don't worry. I, have, I had four safes in my house. It didn't matter. It just took that one time hurriedly putting my purse in a corner. I appreciate everything. Thank you. No. Thank you so much for your testimony. Uh, the next testifier uh, will be Aaron Chafe. Please state your name for the record and proceed with your testimony. Aaron Chase. Chairwoman Moran, uh, members of the committee, my name is Aaron Chase and I'm a Minnesota cannabis patient. I'm here today to express my opposition of Bill 766 as it fails to adequately address the primary barrier to access, affordability. The day I received my intractable pain certification, I was ecstatic. As I had spent the last 12 years exhausting all available treatment options shy of surgery to address my ovarian comp complications and persistent pain as a result of two herniated discs. Unfortunately, the elation subsided after a few visits with the pharmacist, where I quickly learned that my feeling my best without the use of opiates would at a minimum cost $285. In October of 2016, I visited a state that offered reciprocity, Nevada. There I was able to purchase an equivalent supply for just $150. In my frustration, I became a patient advocate with Sensible Minnesota and discovered many others shared my predicament. One of our patients with HIV is only able to afford $200 in medication each month. But if you were to take the dosages recommended by the pharmacist he works with, it would cost him nearly $800 a month. Patients have left their families behind for Oregon, Washington, and Colorado to afford the medications they so desperately need. One mother in particular had to relocate to another 
interstate, source employment, just to provide her son's caregiver here in Minnesota the money to afford the medication to treat his autism. A young mother of four-year-old daughter, plagued by seizures in west central Minnesota, is unable to afford the $500 a month to treat her child's condition. Imagine the stress associated with knowing treatment exists, but is financially inaccessible, that your child's independence or even their life could be taken by a seizure at any given moment. The Minnesota Cannabis Program ought to allow for the additional manufacturers and the vaporization of raw flour, as it's less costly to produce. The state of Pennsylvania began operating only oils and extracts form in February of 2018. In August of 2018, just six short months later, Pennsylvania introduced raw flour amid strong demand for affordable prices from patients. Consequently, local publications have reported prescription costs are expected to be cut in half. Minnesota draws from a rich history of being the vanguard of health measures for other states as for other states to use as a model. Historically, we were ranked first from 2000 to 2006, but according to the United Health Foundation's annual ranking report, we have declined year over year to seventh. For a state with such a storied history of public health, it is unfortunate that our medical cannabis program is less efficient and less affordable than states as Nevada and Pennsylvania. You all have the power to enable this program to function as it was designed to do, provide medical relief to Minnesotans who so desperately need it most. It is my sincerest hope that you act in the best interest of your patient constituents. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, thank is you. Bill Parker here? Uh, yep. Please well, so I, I, I just wanted to uh, note that Bill Parker, the CEO of Leafline Labs, and also um, Dr. Westwood, the CEO of Minnesota Medical Solutions, are here for questions. Um, they weren't necessarily going to testify. Um, uh, Madam Chair, do you mind if I just say a few words ab about the testimony? I, I, Certainly. Representative Adelson. I know that this bill does not go far enough. I, I promise you I understand that and that affordability. And, and in terms of you, I, did, I, I personally did not direct you to a lobbyist. I apologize that that happened with my LA. It must have happened. I am, I, we heard gun bills last week. I am like 700 emails deep. I promise you I actually want to help you, Marin. We had a great conversation with Sensible Minnesota. Patients are number one for me. That's why I took this bill. But we also have to realize that when we passed this legislation, I was not here in 2014. I know a lot of you were, and I know that you were working on that. Um, it's one of the most restrictive programs in the country. So when we look at why the costs, we have two manufacturers. Um, and how, with, with dispensaries, just one in each congressional district. So I think that we have to start talking about, this bill goes to address some of the, um, it, it aims to try to address the issue. I promise you I want to work on legislation to expand this. And you, you will, I will not direct you to a lobbyist. You will talk to me. And I, and, I, and I realize that, and I realize that. And, and then just, Madam Chair, in terms of any changes that happen here at the legislature, what I learned as a freshman is um, it, it's really hard because I wanted to allow students to be able to access medical cannabis just in the schools, and the door was closed on me several times. So promise, I promise that I will work with you, and I will work for you because patients, I mean, I, have, I grew up to a mom that was severely addicted to opioids. I understand when we're talking about this. Uh, and thank you for sharing your story. Um, thank you. Is there uh, so anyone, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Representative Adelson. I, I was just gonna say, if there's, Madam Chair, if there's questions by members, I'd be happy to answer them. Is there anyone else in the audience who wishes to testify on House File 766? <laughs> Sir, please come to the testifier's table. Please state your name and proceed with your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. Uh, my name is Matthew Kaiser. Um, I don't have anything new to add, but I'd like to go into more depth with what has been said. Um, cannabis in itself is a uh, polypharmaceutical. By denying access to raw plant material, you're denying access to hundreds of beneficial compounds that are in those plants that um, aren't being utilized now uh, by patients. Um, when we limit the, uh, the allowable number of cultivators, we're not only limiting patient access and, and keeping the price uh, at an unattainable rate, 
um, but we're also decreasing the amount of variety of um, cultivars that are available to patients. And one of the major things of research that is, that is coming out at this time is that it's the different ratios of all these chemicals. There's, there's terpenes, there's flavonoids, there's CBD, CBN, CBG, Delta 9, THC, Delta, uh, sorry, THCA, THCV, I mean, the, the list goes on. Um, and, and within those compounds, there's hundreds within them. It's the combination of all of those that can benefit one person or another person. And it's, and it's tailoring the medication to the needs of the patient. Um, we're limiting the cult we're, we're limiting the producers right now in what they can provide by only having two of them. Um, I, I also support the uh, provisions for expanding medical access to those of those of us that are on supervision. Um, I'm a medical I'm, I'm an allowable medical can medical cannabis patient in Minnesota, but I'm not allowed to use the medication. Um, I'm forced to go to a, a CBD, a full spectrum CBD product, which is still risky for me. Um, as those products are not as heavily, um, there's, no, there's not as much oversight in that market as there is in the, uh, the cannabis industry in our state. Um, I support this bill, but I also support going much, much further um, as everyone else has said. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. We'll move to discussion members. Uh, Representative Loeffler. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I apologize if the discussion goes longer. I'm supposed to be chairing a meeting at 4.30. Um, but I had a question about the um, amendment A5 that um, I think you would have gone through, except that you mm -hmm. had witnesses that had to leave, so I understand. Um, but it appears to me that this is actually almost a, a totally separate bill about legalizing medical hemp, and um, or at least controlling more the market and who can manufacture and bring it to the to the market, um, including a, a study on the market demand and supply in this state for products made from hemp that can be used for medical purposes. And I just would really like some more background on what this is, what you anticipate, because we've, it, it just feels like a different industry right now. Representative Edelson. Madam Chair, Representative Loeffler. Um, actually, thank you. I was going to say, I, I keep forgetting to go through the amendment. Um, so the provision, um, we actually took Representative Vang's bill, is rolled over. It's being heard in agriculture this Thursday. Um, it would allow, the amendment would allow hemp growers to sell hemp to medical cannabis manufacturers. Um, in 2018, it was added to the Farm Bill federally, allowing um, people to sell hemp. So that would it will be, that would be rolled in. Um, it, the language also includes requested that the Department of Agriculture and some clarifying lang languages there. But the other pieces to it um, are actually the Department of Health. Are you here, Department of Health? Anybody? Oh, can, do you mind joining us at the table? The Department of Health actually had some language that they wanted to add to um, this bill, so I think they can walk through maybe some of the provisions. Sure. Thank you. Please state your name for the record. Um, good afternoon, Madam Chair and members of the committee. My name is Christine Kilkis, and I'm with the, I'm the acting director for the Office of Medical Cannabis. Um, yes, so I can um, go through the the provisions that the Minnesota Department of Health was hoping to see in this amendment, um, and the issues that um, that those address. Um, one of the first is that in the register, there is currently a, allows for uh, registry verification, so a letter that is is generated, um, and it currently requires that the patient's medical condition be listed in the letter. Um, we think that's a patient privacy issue, and we would like to remove that requirement um, uh, of the patient's medical condition in that letter. Um, another provision is that um, that the the current statute is. Um, is not very clear. Uh, we would like to explicitly require that a manufacturer's agreement um, exists and that we make that agreement non-transferable. Um, additionally, we would like to see um, uh, there's currently statutory protections for employees. Um, we, we are adding um, specific um, entities, the uh, employees of hospice, supervised living facilities, and other facilities licensed by the Commissioner of Health under the healthcare facilities section. And then lastly, 
um, we would like to add the Office of Medical Cannabis Program to the list of uh, those with HECA authority, so the Healthcare Enforcement Consolidation Act. Um, MDH's current enforcement penalties are limited to the non-renewal of a manufacturer's registration or a $1,000 fee, um, uh, putting us under the HECA authority um, would better protect patients and program integrity and ensure compliance and establish clearer enforcement procedures. Um, it could include uh, less rulemaking, uh, correction orders for violations, administrative penalty orders, uh, collecting assessed penalties, uh, cease and desist orders if immediate risk to public health, and then uh, including suspension and, uh, or revocation of permits, licenses, registrations, or certificates. Um, so those are the provisions that the Minnesota Department of Health was um, requested be in the amendment. Thank you, Commissioner. Mm -hmm. Further questions? Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Representative Edelson, um, first off, I, I'm listening to the suggestions from the agency of the department in terms of um, kind of a fairly lengthy wish list. Mm -hmm. Uh, certainly some of those sound arguably like they would be to the benefit of the bill or not, depending upon uh, where you stand. Uh, I'm just looking uh, to see what your response would be to those uh, comments that were just shared with the committee. Representative Allison. They are. <sighs> Negative externals, externalities uh, affect me once again. Um, let me just maybe for the sake of argument then, um, Representative Edelson, there, I heard pretty clearly that there's a concern about pricing. <laughs> and, and the one organization that typically talks uh, at length about the, the risk sharing mechanism is the, are the insurances and whatnot. Have you engaged with insurance and health insurance companies or health plans revolving around their uh, consideration of the use of medical marijuana, or as I like to say, medical cannabis, for the provisions already in place? Representative Edelson. Madam Chair, Representative Albright, uh, discussions I, I know have had that had happened, but um, I, ultimately I, I would love to discuss again how do we actually make that happen where insurance companies will cover the medicine because I think it is cost prohibitive. Um, the testifier, Shannon Johnson, the mom that I met, she said that she cannot move her child up a dose up a dose that he could benefit from because she cannot afford it. So ultimately, I would love insurance companies to do it. I know that they have been approached in the past and it's not been possible, but I, I don't know if our manufacturers have any more information on that. <coughs> Dr. Westwood. My name is Jay Westwater. I'm the CEO of uh, Minnesota Medical Solutions. Uh, with regard to uh, alternatives for, for personal pay, we do know that in some cases there have been some reimbursement under workers' comp, uh, but to my knowledge there's been no direct involvement of insurance companies uh, for prospective payment. But uh, our, our colleagues in the, uh, in the workers' comp field have recognized that they're able to get their uh, patients back to work sooner uh, with less stability uh, and more reliability uh, having benefited from medical cannabis. Thank you, Dr. Westwater. Madam Chair, and I would thank you, Madam Chair, and I would also just say that to Representative Albright's point, I think it's one of those things that over this next year, it's something that I would like to start working on. How do we actually make that happen? Um, because we know that if people are using medical cannabis versus, say, uh, opioids, um, I can't remember what testifier brought it up. We are going to have probably better outcomes. There's many studies that show it. I think it's something we need to explore, um, and then also why um, insurance companies may be uh, a little hesitant to, to cover. Right. Representative Liebling. Excuse me, Chair Liebling. Oh. It's nothing like <laughs> being a piece of furniture. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Yes. Well. Yes. Um, so, Representative Adelson, well, thank you for taking on this bill, which is not an easy bill to carry. Yeah, and I, no. I, especially for a person who's in her very first year in the legislature, so it is quite a challenge, and I, I do appreciate that you've taken it on. I, I want to return to the issue about um, some of the questions that were brought up by the 
advocates for patients. And I, I, I hear you loud and clear. You feel very deeply about this. But I'm wondering, you know, this is the, the bill is making its path through. And I, I wish I had, I, frankly, I, I wasn't really paying a lot of attention to the details of this bill until it was coming up for the hearing today and didn't realize that there were amendments that should have been offered and things like that. And the committee has an amendment deadline and we weren't able to do that. But I, I'm just wondering, what is your intention in terms of the process of getting some of these amendments into the bill? I mean, the one that Ms. Schroeder mentioned is something that I think there was language. Um, the, the one she mentioned about th there's a glitch in the law that doesn't allow a patient's caregiver to also be using mm -hmm. the product. I believe that we at one time drafted language to try to fix that, like in a previous session. I don't know what happened to that. But I mean, there are things that I think would be pretty uncontroversial mm -hmm. that we should be doing in this bill to make life better for patients. Um, and um, I'm just concerned about what our process is going to be, since this is the health policy mm -hmm. committee. This would have been the place to do those things that are about health. A lot of this bill seems to be more about business when the issue really that I'm concerned about is patients and health. And we do have an extremely restrictive program. We have, I mean, I remember when it was passed. I mean, a lot of us were very unhappy that it was so restrictive at the time. But, you know, we had a governor who was not in favor of it and had to be kind of drag kicking, screaming, and he ultimately agreed to do it. And that was, I think, why it ended up so restrictive. But now I think we're beyond that. We should be able to, to do more to help people be able to access this medication that they need. And to, for God's sakes, we've got to lower the price. And I, I just, um, I, I don't know. I, I mean, can you just, I don't know if you have the answer to this because it has to do with, you know, when are we going to be able to do amendments? Um, uh, you know, should we... Uh, bring the bill to, um, I mean, is, the, is it ultimately um, the intention that it go to the floor and be a standalone bill? Or, you know, could you talk about that a little bit? Where do you see us being able to make some of these changes that I, I think a lot of people agree really need to be made in mm -hmm. this bill? Mm -hmm. Representative Edelson. Uh, Madam Chair, uh, Representative. Um, I, so my understanding is that's going to go to Commerce and then HH, HHS Finance. So coming to your committee, actually. Um, and my hope was that it would be rolled over into your omnibus. Um, so in terms of the affordability, I mean, listen, I'm, I'm happy. I think, you know, the caregiver piece, I, I, I think that's a, it would be a good amendment. Um, I, I, I wish that I would have, you know, been able to have drafted and offered it. I think we talked about it on the phone, but I am a little swamped over here. So like, as you said, but um, uh, I, there is a piece, there is a provision with, um, there's another bill that um, Representative Considine is carrying, um, adding uh, um, veterans would automatically be, and one of our veterans was here to testify. Um, I plan to just, I wanted to vet out a few things, um, and then I was planning to offer that as an amendment to one of the next stops. So that is one, I am, I'm, you know, we already have, we have two amendments that we have. Um, I'm happy. I'm happy to work with you guys. I, I want to make sure that we're, we're doing the best we can. Um, but of course, with that, um, we have deadlines. And so I, I, you know, if the chair, you are a chair. So maybe if you have, you know, magic capacity to get me back here, I would be happy to do that. Oh, Representative Leibler. Thank you. Ma thank you, Madam Chair, both Madam Chairs here. Um, and thank you. I mean, that was kind of, I was wondering if it was supposed to, you know, I, I guess I don't know if there's a fiscal piece, but if it's coming to HHS finance, I think we could offer some of these amendments there and, and have a discussion about some of this. I mean, you might try to offer them even before that, mm -hmm. you know, if various committees will entertain them. I think that would be a, a good idea. Um, and I just would like to offer you my help too. I mean, we're all swamped. But I, I think that this is very important. And, and just to say, too, to the people in the room that, you know, very few things that we do here are like once and done. So, um, and this certainly, this was a good start. I'm awfully glad that we were able to get this program started in, in Minnesota, and it was a real struggle at the time. But it is time to really, really improve it. And um, 
So you've got some improvements here, but I, I would really like to see some changes and I will try to work with you as best I can and with the advocates as well to try to make sure that we improve it. And then if we don't manage to get it done as much as need, we need to, you know, next year, the second year of the cycle is uh, the so-called policy year when it might be, when we're not putting together the massive budget and it might be a little easier to focus on some policy issues like we have here and make further improvements if we're not able to do all of it this year. So thank you again so much for taking this on. I, you know, I, again, it's, uh, it's really a, a huge effort and really appreciate your hard work. Um, so thank you for that feedback, Chair Liebling, uh, and Representative uh, Edison, thank you for this bill. But I'm thinking also that some of this is really about the policies about this committee here. You know, uh, I, I think the caregiver part of this bill is really something that we can probably amend and put onto this bill. You know, the cannabis program really is a, a program of the privilege. It really doesn't allow many people to afford and get access to this, um, mm -hmm. to what its in, intended purpose is. And I really, really believe that we got to create a process that makes this more fair and equitable for more people. Mm -hmm. um, especially as we look at the opiate crisis that we're going through right now and listen to the testify, it is just does not create an access where, um, and in a way that needs to be a part of this. So what I'm thinking is, why don't we just maybe table this for a moment? Mm -hmm. And maybe as we recess, we can talk about it a little bit longer um, and come back um, after recess with this. Um, yeah, and I chair. think even if we need to, um, even if we chair. need, even, one moment, I mean, even if we need to, um, I think we can, Lay it over for a bit so that we can bring these amendments back into this committee um, for a vote on another day, not not necessarily today. Uh, Representative Pearson, I, I I guess I'm open to that. You know, we we have actually caucused this amendment. Um, I was surprised it hadn't been offered, and had had the discussion when we saw this bill was coming up. Uh, there is support from. The side is my understanding, and, and whether that's suspending the rules and offering the amendment uh, and bringing that back tonight or, or having it at a different future hearing, uh, that'd be something I think we're open to. Okay, we'll talk off during the break more about Madam Chair, if I may. Representative Albright. Thank you, Madam Chair. I think, you know, the, the magnitude of <laughs> um, the conversation around the table, and I, I certainly appreciate the comments, particularly by Chair Liebling, about um, the number of for provisions that typically would be warranted of consideration in this committee. And uh, I certainly appreciate your uh, desire to um, make sure that the, the, the bill as well as amendments are properly vetted. And so rather than um, do that quickly in the next hour and a half or so, I certainly appreciate your willingness to lay the bill on the table and so that both sides can work alongside each other bipartisanly um, to prepare amendments that would make the bill beneficial for all the members that have testified as well as for the author. With that, I would request that we table the bill and uh, work through a timeline that would be respectful of both sides as well as the testifiers to put amendments uh, forward that are um, appropriate and timely. Representative Albright, um, uh, instead of tabling, the, yes, the bill, let's I lay it over, to, maybe. Make a motion to table the bill. Lay it over. M Madam, Ch Madam Chair, I just I just want to make sure that we're able to do this so that we can actually I, I, I want to incorporate those things. I just want to make sure again as a freshman that we're able to do this this year still. Yes, ma'am. We do. Representative. Um, is not okay. There's a motion to table, so we need to take a vote on that. And then, and then um, just, Madam Chair. I still think we need to vote. Chip. To, to the vote. We have to vote. Okay. Yeah. So all in favor of um, to lay it on the table, say aye. 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 All opposed? Okay, we would move and table the bill.
So, uh, we're going to reset uh, and, uh, and reconvene in room 120 of the Capitol. Capitol? <coughs> reconvene until 120 in the Capitol in, at 6 o'clock. Madam Chair, so. I'm fairly certain Commerce is still in there, and I think they had... They said they had the room this evening also. <laughs> and we should, okay, we'll send an email confirming it. Uh, right now, we do believe that we have the room at 6 o'clock. And uh, Madam but Chair. we will look for an email. Madam Chair, is it your intention to take up the bill again this evening so that we should keep our copies? Please keep all your copies in your save folders. All right, please put everything in your safe folders for now. We will re we in recess until the call of the chair. We believe at 6 o'clock we're going to confirm uh, room 120 of the Capitol.